A little different this morning. I have one verse for text. Now usually I read long text and have a long sermon. Do not for a minute think that because I'm reading a short text that this will be a short sermon. Because it won't be. Of that one thing, I can assure you today. I want you to know that the reason that Bob Rogerman is not leading, leading uh, worship is not because he has fallen into disrepute. I appreciate Bob so much and even more on the days that I have to lead worship now. Uh, but Bob, uh, because of his work, is crisscrossing America almost every week. And because of that, he's not been able to practice with the praise band. But as soon as he gets done with this crazy schedule of his, Bob, you are welcome to have it back. I just want you. Not that I don't love watching you folks sing. Although sometimes it's a little scary. But thank you for being here today. Let's. List one verse, one verse, Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 28. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Father, I pray now the blessings upon your word. Thank you that it is a light unto our path, a lamp unto our feet. And may your Holy Spirit lead in all that is said and done that what we do here today might bring glory to you. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. You may be seated. Non negotiable. I want to talk to you today about our non negotiables. Along with that, I repeat our text today. In fact, several verses very quickly. Remove not the ancient landmark which thy fathers have set. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 10 and 11 from the New Living Translation reads this way. Don't steal the land of defenseless orphans by moving the ancient boundary markers. For their Redeemer is strong. He himself will bring their charges against you. And then in Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. I think it is interesting that up until that point in time, that those who were known simply as those of the way, they were not completely discernible from Judaism. In fact, many thought that those who followed Christ was not just another category or just another sector of Judaism. They had not been given a name of their own. But it was in Antioch. And Antioch, by the way, is the first great Gentile church. Remember that as the persecution came into Jerusalem as a result of the persecution ignited by Saul of Tarsus, that the disciples were everywhere. And by the way, when they were driven out of Jerusalem because of their faith, they took their faith with them. They went everywhere preaching the gospel. And one of the places where the gospel landed was in Antioch. Now, as word got back to Jerusalem of the church growing there at Antioch, the apostles at Jerusalem sent Barnabas to go and check out things. And when he got there, he rejoiced by what he saw as a great moving of the Holy Spirit. In fact, he realized very quickly that the young disciples, the number of young disciples, were too great for him alone to handle and so Barnabas departed and went to Tarsus where Saul, after his conversion, had returned and came back with Saul for him to help him disciple the disciples at Antioch. Now so great was this movement 
this movement of the Spirit, that the disciples there became, for the first time ever, known as Christians. Christians, like Christ, that is the name you and I carry. Now, because of the lack of testimony of some, and frankly some who call themselves Christian, who do not live Christ-like lives, among some people today, the term Christian has fallen into disrepute. In fact, I was engaged in kind of a debate with some younger believers who said they don't like to call themselves Christian any longer because of the testimony, the negative testimony of some and the connotation that the word Christian have with some. Now, in my opinion, they've taken the wrong route because instead of removing the idea or the name of Christian, we need to start living up to it. Christian means like Christ. Now, going back to our text, the idea of the ancient landmark. The ancient landmarks go back to the time when Joshua, after conquering the land of Canaan, divided the promised land. Each tribe received a region, and each family received an eternal inheritance, a portion of land, a parcel of land, that was to be in their family forever. Some unscrupulous men might seek to increase their own holdings by going under the cover of darkness and removing the boundary markers of his neighbor. Well, I think we understand that that is very unethical. But in the sight of God, it was Obama because it was God who had established the inheritance of each tribe and each family. So to move those boundary markers, to move those landmarks, was not only an offense against a man's neighbor, it was a personal offense against God. Listen to this verse again, back in Proverbs 23. Don't steal the land of defenseless orphans by moving the boundary marker. For their redeemer is strong. He himself, will bring charges against thee. So moving the boundary marker of your neighbor's land was an extremely serious offense. God warned them that he is watching and will avenge those who fall victim to such treachery. God watched carefully over the inheritance of his people. There are also, there is also, a spiritual inheritance for God's people. In the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments offered a moral code of conduct that God expected of His people. Now, we've talked about this before. The Mosaic Law did not contain Ten Commandments. It contained, it contained 613 commandments because the Law of Moses as a whole was not just the moral code, but it included the ritual law, which governed the spiritual life of Israel, but also the civil law, which governed the day-in, day-out life of Israel, because God wanted an ordered society. But when it came time for him to lay down the proper conduct that he expected from his people, he was brief. Only Ten Commandments. Now, nine of those Ten Commandments are repeated in the New Testament. The only one not repeated is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Because there's no such thing in the church age as a Christian Sabbath. The Sabbath law was a completely different thing. And when Christ rose from the dead on the first day of the week, Believers began to meet not on the seventh day, but in order to distinguish them from Judaism, they began to meet on the first day of the week to worship God 
and to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I saw an interesting thing this week. It said, go to church the Sunday after Easter because Jesus is still risen. Now think about that. Because we have some folks who show up on Christmas and Easter. Not so much anymore, but it used to be that way anyway. Now, most of those folks don't show up at all. But the point I'm trying to make is that in the New Testament church, the resurrection was so significant in the minds of believers that they celebrated it every week. And in fact, the thing that made them powerful, the thing that enabled them to spread the gospel through the known world within three decades after the ascension of Jesus was they continued to preach the resurrection of Jesus Christ in power and in the authority of the Holy Spirit of God. Do you think maybe that we relegate the resurrection to so little a space of our life. Think about what Paul wrote to the Roman church. That if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. And what? Believe in your heart. That God has raised him from the dead. You can't be saved. Without believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is a landmark to our faith. That is essential to our belief. Now, if we are going to be Christian, my question today is this. How much can you dumb down Christianity and it still be Christian? Because if I'm any judge of the trends in American Christianity today, by the way, our church is a little bit unique in the fact that I think that we still, more than anything else, promote the teaching and the preaching of the Word of God. Most of these huge churches, and I have no argument with them as long as they are preaching the gospel, but most folks are drawn to those churches not because of the preaching of the word, but because of their music. Now, I wish we had live music. I wish we did. I wish we could. But even if we did, I would like to think that our church in its history has been a gospel preaching church and we could continue that no matter what else may come. If I'm any judge, however, and I have no right to be there, but if I am, just in watching the trends among Christianity in America, it seems to me that there is a trend to become more like the world without crossing the line. Someone told the story of Ethan Allen. Ethan Allen was one of the founders of our country. Ethan Allen and the, I think it was the Green Mountain Boys or something like that. I think they probably came out of Vermont. But the story was, and Ethan Allen, by the way, was a Christian. Not, not the furniture guy, by the way. <laughs> this is a different guy. Ethan Allen was hiring, hiring a driver for his family. And he interviewed these fellows by taking them up into the mountains and telling them to drive as fast as they could through this mountain route. And all of them drove down this mountain route at breakneck speed until the last guy, and he was very cautious and very slow. And when he got to the bottom of the mountain, Ethan Allen hired him as the driver for his family. Someone asked him, why is it that you hired the slowest guy of the bunch? And he said, because of somebody is going to take care of my family. I want them to be as cautious and keep them as far away from danger of falling over the cliff 
as possible. There are some today in Christianity that are trying to be as much like the world as possible without falling over the edge. And I ask the question again, how much can you dumb down Christianity and it still be Christian? 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17 says this. Do not love the world or the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. I fear that this trying to be like the world and imitating the world is because of our love for the world. The church at Corinth had a multitude of problems with compromise. Paul addressed it head on. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 18. This is in the Living Translation. Do not team up with the... Do not team up with those who are unbelievers. How can righteousness be a partner with wickedness? How can light live with darkness? What harmony can they be, there be between Christ and the devil? How can a believer be a partner with an unbeliever? And what union can there be between God's temple and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said... I will live in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them, says the Lord. Don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. And I will be your father. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord God Almighty. I'm not saying that in order to please God, we have to dress like the fundamentalists of old and only wear white shirts with skinny black ties. I'm not saying that we have to be self-righteous. I'm saying that if we become mesmerized with the world and the things of the world, then the love of the Father departs. And by the way, all the glitters of this world, it tells us very clearly, it is not going to pass away. It is in the process of passing away. I believe the clock is ticking. Now, I have never been a date setter. And I've always been cautious of those who say, well, the signs point to it. Because here's the deal. The next event on God's prophetic calendar is the, right, rap, rap, bleh, bleh, the rapture of the church. Brush my teeth, can't do a thing with my mouth this morning. The rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church is imminent. It is at hand. Remember when Paul wrote, he said, And we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord. Paul expected that the rapture could happen in his lifetime. So be careful about looking at signs. Because in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the trumpet could sound, and those who know Christ are going to be out of here in the wink, the twinkling of an eye. Even so come Lord Jesus. Amen. There are four reasons Christians compromise today. Number one, to indulge their own desires. You know what, if sin, if sin was snarly and ugly, I'd have no problem with that. How about you? I mean, if a demon came to my door and was, oh, 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 I, I, I'm not going to let him in. But sin has its pleasure for a season. The problem is, is that it extracts more from us than we believe or think would happen. And it can destroy us spiritually and physically. There are things, there are things, and by the way, this was an issue in the New Testament church because particularly the church of Corinth, they were hung up on liberty. Well, I can do this, I'm free in Christ. 
Yeah, you're free in Christ, but here's a here's uh, bulletin. The moral code that God set in the Ten Commandments is still relevant today. It doesn't save you, but it is still relevant. It's still wrong to lie. It's still wrong to envy. It's still wrong to be immoral. It's, it's still wrong to have any other God before the God. It's still wrong to worship idols. It's still wrong to profane His name. So that moral code has never changed. It is incorporated right into Christianity. When we get to the point that we want our way, and by the way, that's the human way, we want our way more than God's way, then we are indulging ourselves rather than being pleasing to God. Psalm chapter 127 verse 7 says, The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life if we give it into his charge. Number two, biblical ignorance. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 15 says, Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. You should never have to come to your preacher and ask, well, what's wrong with this? Because you should be a student of the Word of God and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you and He will answer those questions for you. And by the way, there's a reason why it says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. And then it adds to the end, against such there is no law because anything that exemplifies those virtues are completely right in the sight of God. But usually when we say, well, what's wrong with this? It is because we are trying to indulge our own desires. If you give your life into God's hands, He will keep you from the desire to do evil. Number three, a fear of being labeled. You know, honestly, there are some that would not want to be labeled as a Christian. Because we've got a negative connotation of what it means to be a Christian. We've got the idea that a Christian means you've got to be narrow-minded, that you've got to be judgmental, that you've got to have no fun at all, because apparently Christianity means you're not to enjoy anything. And yet it's the joy of the Lord that's your strength. There is joy in serving Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. Oh, that's weak. There is joy in serving Jesus. Amen. That wasn't any better. I'm going to have to give you a test before you can go home. There is joy in serving Jesus. Amen. Now you're overdoing it. <laughs> Acts chapter 5, verses 40 through 42. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them. Hmm. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them. By the way, they have just threatened them. Don't you dare speak in the name of Jesus again. In fact, do you know those who beat them that day, they wanted to kill them. But there was a teacher by the name of Gamaliel who drew them aside and says, Fellas, if by chance this is of God, we don't want to stand against it. And if it does not, if it is not of God, then it will perish. And so instead of killing them, because they wanted to, they just beat them. And when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. You got that, didn't you? They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, or we will label you. And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. There is something wrong with these people. I mean, 
there's a screw loose somewhere. The people who had the authority, who were the same ones who led to the death of Jesus, wanted to kill them, and they warned them, don't you talk about him anymore, or else. And they left, and they were happy about it, and went back and started teaching and preaching every day. Can you imagine when the little cronies of those people who beat them came and said, those Christians are back at it again. I think some of those folks had strokes. And I think some of them accepted Jesus as Savior. And daily in the temple and in every house. Between Sundays, let me ask you this. And by the way, you're the, you're the cream of the crop. You're the core of our church. It doesn't get any better than you. Now we got a few folks home today because they're sick. But basically you are the cream of the crop. I mean there's not folks who are part of our church that don't show up. The ones who are part of our church show up. You showed up. You are the cream of the crop. And I ask you as the elite of the Christians at Faith Family Fellowship what do you do with Jesus between Sundays? Do you talk about him in your house? Do you read about him in the word? Do you make your home a house of prayer? Daily in the temple and in every house, they cease not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. The final reason why they compromise their Christianity is because they were misguided in an attempt to be relevant. Now there is the watchword today. We want to be relevant. Now understand, when they're saying that we want to be relevant, understand what they are saying. They are saying that the gospel as written that the Word of God, as written today, is not relevant. It's antiquated. Do you know one of the problems, and I don't want to go too far down this path. As far as a nation goes, our founding fathers were geniuses in writing the Constitution of the United States of America. And now I realize there's this thing called council culture and they're trying to superimpose the morals of the 21st century into the world of the 17th century and it just doesn't work that way. And I also understand that every one of our founding fathers had flaws before their day, in their time, in their society, these men understood three things. They first of all understood they did not want a monarchy like England. Because sometimes you had a good king and sometimes you just were ruled over by idiots. I'll say no more. <laughs> they also understood this. That they had defeated the most powerful nation in the world because of the sovereign divine will of God. Because they wrote into our constitution the idea of a creator, of a maker, of an eternal sovereign. And the third thing they understood is that they wanted to incorporate, they wanted to approve a document that would transcend culture and time. That would be relevant for the life of the republic. And by the way, that's what we are. We're a constitutional republic. Don't buy into this thing that we're a democracy. We're a constitutional republic. That's how they formed it. Now, the way you look at the constitution decide, determines your politics. If you look at the constitution 
as a growing document, then all of a sudden you try to superimpose your values of today into the minds of our founding fathers. But if you understand that the Constitution was fixed in the eternal life, and that's a bad way to say it, but in the life of the Republic, then you understand that there are some things you cannot leave to opinion. Now, I say that only to say this. There are two ways to look at Scripture. You can look at Scripture as being non-relevant because how could Scripture have foreseen the issues of the 21st century? And so then all of a sudden, instead of preaching the Word of God as it is, we try to make it relevant to a satanic culture. <sighs> If you don't think some of the things going on in our country today are satanically inspired, you're not paying attention. Or you look at the Word of God, and this is what it says about itself. Psalm chapter 119, verse 89. Forever, O Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Forever, O oh Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Now, couple with it this verse. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. God speaking here. I am the Lord. I do not change. Amen. Aren't you glad? That God does not change? What if God woke up tomorrow morning and he looked at you and he says, you know what, I don't think I like that guy anymore. I'm done with this thing about forgiveness. I think I'm going to really give them what they deserve. And we're all crispy critters. I'm glad God doesn't change. And what was sin in the first century of the church in the eyes of a holy, unchanging God is sin today. And what is righteous in the eyes of a holy, unchanging God is righteous today. He changes not. we do there was a movement I think it probably started with the Constitution because even in those days there were some who wanted to separate God from society they misread the First Amendment the First Amendment says government is to have no power over faith it doesn't say that faith is to have no power over government and I think they thought, well, you know, back in Europe, there were these churches. The Church of Rome held sway over most of Europe. The Church of England held sway over all of the, all of the uh, empire of, of, of England. And, and we don't want any church to have any kind of power over our country. And so there were some in their mind that the separation of church and state meant that faith was to have their hands off of our society and that's not what the first amendment has to say one of the reasons our country has grown in prosperity and power for 240 plus years is because it was contrary to what they want to tell you today if you read the statements of our founding fathers if you read the statements of those who were on the Mayflower when they came to America, they, this country was founded on the principles of faith. Amen. That's why God has blessed us for 240 plus years.
But we need to understand that God is no respecter of persons. And God does not owe us His blessing. And if we remove Him from our society, God will remove us from His blessing. That's my introduction. <laughs> Would you like to hear the sermon? We'll do it next week. Okay? I want us to keep in mind this. And the farther I went into this, the more I realized I'm not going to finish this today. Unless you all want to skip lunch. Glenn would do it. <laughs> then everybody would hate Glenn. And I'm not going to do it to you. But I want you to remember these things. Because next week I'm going to finish this message. On Mother's Day I'm going to finish this message. I'm a little erratic anyway. There was one year I thought, well, I'm going to really change it up on Mother's Day, and I preached on hell. Not a popular song. But next week is Mother's Day, and we're going to honor mothers. And, uh, but I'm going to finish this message next week because I think we need to be reminded of who we are and of what we believe. And this church has stood here for a hundred and twenty, anybody know, 100, over 125, right, years? Something like that. And we believe today the same principles that we believed then. Because if it was right then, and we serve a holy, sovereign God, it is right today. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the landmarks that you have set down. I thank you for the boundaries of our faith that you have established. The wall that you have placed up and you have clearly delineated that wall. And that gives us security because we know that when we go beyond your word that we're on the outside of the wall and we need to make corrections and get back in. But if we are within the inside of the boundaries you have established, then Father, we rejoice in knowing that we are safe in your hands and you will bless us. And I pray, dear God, that as we're dismissed from each other today, that you will through your spirit, speak to us and renew in us a loyalty to the faith once delivered to the saints. That what we do, more than anything else, will bring glory to you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to thank our audience on the internet for joining us today. And I'm assuming that probably some of our folks are watching. And if you are, I want to wish you a good day and let you know that we are praying for you today, for your health to improve and for whatever you are facing, that God will hold you close and give you healing and victory. God bless and have a good day. <laughs>